Hello again. This is Math 1120 coming to you from the College of DuPage. And the title of this lecture is, well, this is the continuation of the lecture entitled Waves and Such. And I encourage you to be a very active learner as you watch this video. As you know from the previous video you watched, sound is not transmitted in a vacuum. You need a medium to hear sound. That's a very important concept. And then we're going to continue talking about waves and such. This is part two of that lecture. And we will have some just-in-time mathematical uh, interventions. We'll revisit the concept of pressure, and we'll also revisit logarithms during um, these uh, lectures, this and the next one. Okay, so uh, an important thing is waves are reflected. Here you see a uh, spring that uh, somebody put a, a wave onto, and so it's moving along, and we're having a strobe light making the exposure so we see what's really happening. So the wave moves along and moves along, but when it hits this boundary, it is reflected, and you see the wave will go back, but notice that it is inverted here. So uh, what happens here, uh, the photos show a wave pulse traveling to the right. It's reflecting at the fixed end of the spring and traveling back. But notice that it was inverted. So that's what's being talked about here. If a, um, a wave comes in like this, and you see these are pictures getting closer and closer to the boundary, what will happen is when it hits the fixed boundary, it is reflected, but it is inverted. And so it's going back, the invert of what uh, inversion of what we had. Uh, we're also assuming that there's no loss of signal that's happening at that. But suppose you just tie a loop around here so it's loose, and then the wave comes in, comes in, comes in, and it is reflected. But you see it's reflected in the same way without being inverted. So the reflection of a wave at a fixed end is different than at a free end. The takeaway is there is reflection of these waves and it's some complicated business. Moreover, uh, what can happen is here you have a blue uh, wave going this way and a red wave going this way and uh, they come together but when they come together they add in a negative way. So you see this was the red wave, this was the blue wave but they subtract and they kind of cancel out. That's called destructive interference. The two waves interfere with one another and go on. But there also can be constructive interference. Here you two see two waves going and they come together, but there's the blue one, there's the red one, but they add to one another. So there's the red one, there's the blue one, and the peak actually grows. So you see you can have constructive and destructive interference of waves. And in fact, that leads us to the principle of superposition of waves. Whenever two waves overlay, the resulting displacement is any position and any time is obtained by the vector. So you see these are vectors, addition of the displacements of each of the two individual waves. You want to think about that for a while, probably. Now this principle holds for the overlap of waves that look like sine curves, as we just showed, as well as for individual wave pulses. It also applies to both longitudinal and transverse waves, which we've talked about before. And you can even have multiple waves, three or more waves combining in that way. So here's a way to test our understanding. So two waves are traveling in opposite direction on the x-axis. They encounter each other, and the net displacement of the superposition of the two pulses is zero. Which of the following must be true? They're identical, but one is inverted relative to the other. They have the same width. They're traveling at the same speed. And the answer is, for the two pulses to completely cancel each other, they must be inverses of each other. Note that two pulses of the same width but differing heights would not cancel. The correct answer is A. Another thing that happens when you have a wave, and this wave is bouncing back and forth, it's fixed on both ends, and so you pluck it like, a, like you pluck a guitar string or something like that. So it starts doing uh, this. 
Well, what we have is a thing called a fundamental frequency, but you see it's fixed. So what will happen is there actually, if you're looking at this on an oscilloscope, there will be standing waves that will happen. And this is the uh, what's called the first fundamental frequency. But then you have other, fun, uh, this is called a harmonic frequency. That's when n is equal to 2. When n is equal to 3, you see you have three copies. When n is equal to 4, you get this. Now, what happens is the wavelength gets um, shorter and shorter. That means the frequency gets higher and higher. And you really don't hear all of these, but these are uh, there. And there really are an infinite number of these that happen when you make a musical tone. Uh, like plucking a guitar string or uh, a violin string or something like that. So anyway, we have equations for these uh, frequencies. The first uh, frequency is given by this, F1. The first fundamental frequency is 1 over 2L. That was the length of this string. This is uh, an equation that we've actually had before. This is the square root of the tension in the spring, the force, divided by um, the, uh, the mass. Uh, and we also have an expression for the wavelength. So lambda n is 2L over n. And you see as n gets bigger, um, lambda gets shorter. That means the frequency is higher. And uh, let's see. So F sub n then is equal to um, n times V over 2L. And that's n times F1. So you see the fundamental f frequency really matters. So on a string of length L that is held stationary at both ends, standing waves can only have frequencies F sub N. They can't have any frequency. It's only these that are related to L and the wave speed by the formula Fn is equal to N V over 2L. And that's N times this fundamental frequency. The units on these F sub Ns are Hertz because they're frequencies. The frequencies corresponding to n bigger than or equal to 2 are the harmonics or overtones of the fundamental frequency. If you study music theory, you know a lot about this. And there are an infinite number of standing wave frequencies, each corresponding to a specific integer. And integers will be 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth. So let's test our understanding of this uh, section then. So in the apparatus shown in this figure, here's the picture. So we've got a wire that's fixed there, but it's held taunt by this mass. And then you pluck that, so this is the vibrating portion of the wire. Uh, so in that picture, tension is created by the wire, in the wire, by the weight of the hanging block. If the vibrating portion of the wire has a fundamental frequency F, when the block has mass M, what should the block's mass be in order to give a fundamental frequency of 2F? You can pick A, B, or C. So here's the solution. The frequency is related to the tension in the wire by this equation. This equation says that the fundamental frequency is directly proportional to the square root of the tension. That's F. And you see F then is equal to mass times acceleration. So uh, since the tension is equal to the block's weight, then that means the tension is the block's weight and that was given in the problem then uh, that tells us that the um, tension is directly proportional to uh, the mass now that really means that it's the uh, it's the square root of the well the tension is directly proportional to that therefore f1 is directly proportional to the square root of the mass because this is ma under the square root of the block's mass in that case to double the frequency you must increase the mass by a factor of 4. So the correct answer is C, 4M. Here's another problem. This is dealing with a bass string. A bass is a, like a big violin kind of thing. The E string on an electric bass, actually this is not uh, that kind of a bass. This is a bass guitar. The E string on an electric bass, that's a bass guitar, produces the instrument's lowest possible frequency. That is 41 hertz. The string has a length of 0 0.86 meters and a mass per unit length of 0 0.015 kilograms per meter. Or to calculate the tension in the string, calculate the frequency and wavelength of the second harmonic, and calculate the frequency and wavelength of the 
third harmonic. So here's a picture. The second harmonic has two um, um, components, one and two, and the third one has three, one, two, and three. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we know that uh, we have this equation here, F1 is equal to, and we have FT, so we just solve that for FT. Now again, you should verify these calculations, but FT is equal to 4 mu L squared F1 squared. Now we know that mu is this number, L is this number, and F1 is that number, so we substitute all those in. Here's the calculation. You should verify these calculations. That's really good practice for you. And you get 76, and the units here have to be Newtons. So we'll use this equation and solve for FT and substitute the numbers in. In part B, we're supposed to find the frequency and wavelength of the second harmonic. Well, here is the equation for frequency. So F sub N is equal to NV over 2L, and that is N times F1, but this is second, so that's really 2 times F1. Uh, so, and we knew that was 41 hertz, so it's 2 times 41 hertz is 82 hertz. And the wavelength is going to be, this is the equation that I showed you before, lambda n is equal to 2L over n. And so uh, what we do is we take 2L over um, n and we, uh, we, we saw, uh, over, and 2 over 2 is 1. So we get that as the uh, uh, wavelength and the frequency for the uh, second harmonic. The third harmonic is likewise using those equations just with 3 instead of that. So we get these answers. And here's a problem for you to practice down here. Now we're going to have a little intervention about pressure. Pressure is symbolized by lowercase p or uppercase p. Now this can be confusing, so make sure you know what p you're talking about because we're also going to be very soon talking about power. But pressure is the force applied perpendicular. So you see it's a force perpendicular. So if you have something happening at an angle, that's going to be a core, uh, that's going to be a component of the force, but it's the net force perpendicular to a given area. So it's the force applied perpendicular to the surface of an object per unit area. And so, for example, this would be pounds per square inch, or this would be newtons per square meter, or something like that. Uh, sometimes we talk about gauge, gauge pressure, and that's the pressure relative to the ambient pressure. So, for example, um, it turns out that the atmosphere is normally 14.7 pounds per square inch. So when you measure your um, tire pressure using a gauge, you're fighting against that pressure. So it really is uh, a pressure relative to that ambient temperature, or not temperature, but ambient pressure. Now, various units are used to express pressure, and some of these derive from the units of force divided by area. Now, the SI unit, which is going to be newtons, per square meter is called the Pascal, after the great mathematician Pascal. And PA does come up in one of your uh, low stakes assessments, so that's what it is, is a Newton per square meter. Uh, in the English system, it is the uh, pound, uh, pound per square inch. We talked about that, and sometimes that's abbreviated PSI. And you can do other things too. These are mostly in meteorology, but st standard atmospheric pressures, they could say it's four atmospheres. Um, and that's the pressure of the atmosphere. And they also uh, use a unit called Tor. That is 1 over 760 of this unit. And sometimes they talk about centimeters of water, millimeters of mercury, or an inch of mer mercury. And that's when they give you a thing called a barometric pressure. So anyway, here's what it means. P is the pressure. It is the force. It's the force perpendicular, the normal force on that area. It comes in pascals, and here's the units of pascals. Now, uh, we really don't need much from section 12.7, but there we're talking about longitudinal standing waves. So when longitudinal waves propagate in a fluid such as air or water contained in a pipe with finite length, the waves are reflected from the ends in the same way that transverse waves on a string are reflected at its end. This supervision of the waves traveling in opposite directions again forms a standing wave. So recall that sound is a longitudinal wave. 
but often sound is measured as pressure against the microphone. So it's the pressure of the sound and there are other derived units. So often uh, when you talk about sound on an oscilloscope, you're really measuring the pressure. And so even though this is a longitudinal wave, it will show up as a transverse wave on an oscilloscope. Now here's an example of um, uh, what really will happen then. So you will have a, a, a wave, a sound wave emanating from the speaker. Now let's suppose you were at a sweet spot where this distance was the same as this distance. Well, you see the signal from here and the sound from here, the sound from both of those will reach you at the same time. And so they will add constructively and they will not interfere. If you're off the sweet spot, like over here with your microphone, what happens is this one being closer will cut to you faster. This one will be out of phase and they will be out of cycle and they will do destructive interference. So this one is an example of destructive interference. This one is an example of constructive interference. So we want to be sitting at a sweet spot. So those distances from the speakers are the same if you're trying to really enjoy the music in its uh, richest form. In closing, now more than ever, time is precious. Each day must count. Do the math. It will make you strong. And now more than ever, take care of yourself and of others. We'll be continuing this lecture in the next video.